Hello and welcome to our program, Where God Weeps, a program where we speak about the situation of the suffering and persecuted church around the world. When Philippine President Duterte swept into power in 2016, he unleashed a war on drugs, which to date has claimed the lives of over 14,000 people. With an 84% approval rating, there's been little stomach for opposition. In 2017, however, the Catholic Bishops' Conference of the Philippines issued a pastoral letter condemning the killings. The chairman at that time was His Excellency Archbishop Socrates Villegas. To tell us more about this war on drugs, the role of the Catholic Church, and the situation of Catholics in the Philippines, it's my great privilege to welcome His Excellency Archbishop Socrates Villegas. Your Excellency, thank you for being with us here today. Thank in you our for program. the invitation. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you. Your Excellency, the question of the war on drugs, can you bit, give us a bit of a background? How did this come about, this, this war on drugs, and what is at the root of the problem? I think the root of the problem is the heart of the human person. There is a longing in the heart of every human person for meaning. There is a longing for purpose. People look at it and look at money, they look at sex, they look at more power, they look at uh, realization of their ambitions. Some people use drugs. Some people gamble. We did not realize the uh, immensity of this problem until the present uh, president was elected. And he called our attention to the worsening situation of uh, drug abuse and drug dependence. Why is this issue suddenly on the rise so strongly among young people in the Philippines? Well. Probably because as a mayor in the southern Philippines, he saw that it was a problem in his city. And when he took up national leadership, he saw that this is more than a problem in his city. This is a problem that is widespread in the Philippines. But there is a big difference in approach. Uh, for one, we want to look at the drug issue as a spiritual and uh, psychological sickness. So if it is sickness, it needs cure. It needs healing. Whereas the present government looks at it from a different paradigm. They look at drugs as a criminal problem. And because they are criminals, they are treated first with the full force of law rather than with the compassion that we give to sick people. The president has an 84% approval rating at the moment. Is it as a consequence of the Filipino longing for, against the question of corruption, against the chronic question of poverty? Is that why he has maintained uh, such a high level of approval in the society? In the Philippines, we have an expression, it is betting on your last card. So you think that you have explored this option, it didn't work. You have explored this other option, it did not work. You have explored a third option, it did not work. Maybe we can explore this other option which we have not yet tried. And uh, people elected him into office thinking that we have explored liberalism, we have explored nationalism, we have explored revolutions even, peaceful revolutions, and it did not work. Maybe this time it will work. Unfortunately, unfortunately, when you approach a, a problem with a paradigm that this is the only solution, most likely it will fail. Because the solution being applied to the drug problem has something lacking in it, God. If God is in the solution, why are we killing the drug addict? If God is in the solution, why are we not giving them alternatives? If God is in the solution, why are we just 
uh, saying, you have no more chance, you have lost all hope, and kill. That is not the way to solve it. Your Excellency, you were the chairman of the Bishops' Conference at the time in 2017 when you issued a pastoral letter for I think a long a while perhaps the church had been watching the situation and unsure perhaps how to respond but in 2017 the Catholic Bishop said no this is not the answer this hard answer as you've expressed to us what provoked you what were the alarm bells first of all that led you finally to say no this is not the answer and what was the final straw if you will that clicked the whole issue he was elected in May and the first meeting of the bishops after his election was July. And in July, after his election, we thought it was too soon to make a judgment because we wanted to give him a chance and we wanted to listen to the mandate that the people had bestowed on him. But as the months went by, the uh, statistics were rising and there are more tears in our communities and there is blood flowing in our streets and uh, we came together and we agreed that this is becoming a reign of terror and uh, to sow terror to sow fear is not the way to govern because governance should come from freedom it should not come from coercion that is why we raised the alarm what was the final straw because if I understand correctly, for many in the public, it was the killing of a 17-year-old young man, uh, which provoked an outcry, a public outcry. Was the letter coincidental to this, or previously the bishops had decided no, as you mentioned? I just say this because in the Filipino society, from what I can read, the, the déclenche was the death of this 17-year-old boy, where there was a question whether he was at all uh, well, if guilty. you look at the chronology of the statements of the bishops, the first strong statement of the bishops actually came in January, whereas the killing of the 17-year-old came even months later. So as early as January, we were already raising the alarm. And formulating a response. Yes, and not just a protest, but an alternative. A protest is good, but alternative is always better. And the alternative we were offering is uh, a drug rehab, a community-based, a family-based drug rehabilitation program. And the church has been deeply engaged in this. I want to come to this question because uh, you have, uh, you are, as a Catholic church, you are addressing the question both on a practical level and on a spiritual level. So perhaps first the practical level and then the spiritual level. How is the Catholic church helping the families, helping the victims. What is it that you are doing practically to help these drugs? It is actually three-pronged. Number one is you have to attend to the victims of the drug addicts. Some drug addicts have killed other people. So we have to attend to them because they are grieving and they are thinking of revenge, of getting even, and we want to process them not in the sense of playing blind to the injustice, but in the sense of being able to move forward. That we cannot live in a cycle of revenge because nobody wins in a culture of revenge. The second approach is towards the drug user who from the point of view of law is a criminal, but who from our point of view is a needy person needing assistance. So we want to reach out to them and offer them an alternative and to trust that uh, the church and the local community will take care of them and give them a new opportunity for life. The third is the victims, the families of those who have been killed. Uh, those who have been killed uh, left behind loved ones, uh, maybe a child, maybe a, a wife or a husband, maybe a mother or a father, and they are grieving. And uh, the victims, the families of the victims of extrajudicial killings also need our attention. For this, we provide livelihood because they do not need rehab. What they need is a consolation, the presence of the church to be able to say, uh, there is still hope for you. So it is a three-pronged approach. It is for the victims of the drug addicts. It is for the drug addicts themselves 
and the families of those who have been killed. On the ground level, we provide livelihood, we provide counseling, and we provide spiritual direction, and simply just presence. In a manner of speaking, sometimes we cannot do anything but sit down and cry with them. And if that is the only thing we can do, we will still do that. And Your Excellency, the question of spirituality. You mentioned the practical questions. What about the spiritual aspect? The first is uh, to teach. To teach those who are onlookers that it is wrong. It is immoral. It is sinful to kill a brother for whatever reason. And we must keep on teaching. The second is to pray for them because we believe that in the end, it is the grace of God that will touch hearts. That it is not flowery words, it is not uh, sweet words that will convert hearts, but it is the grace of God, the spirit that is at work, and that is always the fruit of prayer. But the third also is praying for the dead, because they are increasing every day. And uh, right now at the present count, there are more than 13,000 who have been killed because of this drug campaign, anti-drug campaign. And we have to pray for the dead. They are not just statistics. They have a they family. Are human they are human persons. They are created in the likeness of God. And they are, they are souls. And we have to pray for them so that the peace that they did not receive here on earth, they will receive in the afterlife. Your Excellency, you've, that is the Catholic Church, has taken also a rather bold step in offering, not sanctuary, but a place for the police officers who wish to testify, a space to speak and to record their testimony. First of all, why uh, was this necessary? And secondly, what is this and what is the hope to achieve? Well, it came as a surprise. It, it is just attending to a need that has surfaced. Our eyes were mostly focused on the victims of drug addicts, the drug addicts themselves, and the victims of the extrajudicial killings and their families. And then, uh, because of the conscientization, because of the renewed teachings about the sanctity of human life, uh, some police officers, police personnel, have come forward to their parish priests and said, I was involved and my conscience is bothering me. What could I do? What should I do? Can God still forgive me? So we have to attend to them because that is another section in society probably responsible for the killing. And uh, the prayer of the people is now taking effect and uh, the grace of God is touching them and they want to stop it. They want to change their lives. So the church is there also, not as a collector of evidences, but as a mother welcoming her child who has gone astray. And uh, if they seek uh, legal assistance, then we give them lawyers who can uh, uh, write down their testimony. But our main concern is to bring them back to the grace of God. Your Excellency, we've talked a lot about now about this particular question of the war on drugs. Now I want to change the chapter a little bit to talk about the situation of the Filipino uh, Catholic Filipino community in general. Filipinos are, as we know, the most Catholic nation in Asia. 80% uh, of uh, Filipinos consider themselves, uh, profess themselves as Catholics. Although the uh, survey, uh, social weather stations, indicates that there is a decline in the membership and participation in the Catholic Filipino community, my question is twofold. Why are historically Filipinos so Catholic, so attached to the church? And the second question is, why are they now falling, falling away? Why are young people, especially young people, leaving the church? Well, the Filipino Catholicity is very Marian. And I can say that uh, because of this devotion to the Mother of God, we have kept the faith. There is not one month in the Philippines where there is no feast in honor of the Virgin Mary for whatever title. And if you look at the names of our baptized Catholics, they would be either Lourdes, Fatima, Maria, Miriam, or any other variation 
about the Virgin Mary. So the Filipino Christianity is deeply Marian. And that, I believe, has helped us to keep the faith. On the other hand, it is observable that there are young people who are sort of turning away from the church or who do not believe in the church or who do not go to church at all. Why so? I believe it is the fact that the gospel has to compete with so many ideologies. Secularism, materialism, pleasure-seeking generation, uh, instant joy, instant gratification. All these values are very attractive. Unfortunately, in time, we discover that they are not lasting. And I am very sure that in time also, our young people will understand that the culture of pleasure-seeking, the culture of promoting yourself, the culture of materialism, the culture of uh, comfort-seeking, this will pass. As and in the end... As you mentioned, it, it leads gently back to the emptiness inside. To the emptiness inside of us. And uh, in the end, we will understand that that emptiness can only be filled up by no less than God himself. You are also the president of the Philippine, rather the Asian, Mariological Society. Um, how important has Our Lady been in your life? In my life, well, I grew up in a family that is very devoted to the Virgin Mary. I would uh, wake up at uh, 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning, go to the room of my parents, get my allowance for school, which is always in in front of their mirror. <laughs> you just get it there. It's you know yours. where it is, yes. But every time I go to the mirror to get my allowance for school, I would see my parents kneeling by their bedside, praying the rosary in the morning, praying for the three of us, their children. They did not ask us to join them. But eventually, we started to pray the rosary to join them because our parents taught by example. So that is my devotion to the Virgin Mary. And in school, the uh, catechists and the fathers taught us how to appreciate the rosary. My father taught me two important lessons in life. He said, number one, when you leave the house, never leave the house without a handkerchief in your pocket. It is a sign of good manners. Second, never leave the house without a rosary in your pocket. We want to take care of you, but we cannot. But you have a rosary in your pocket. We are sure that your mother, the mother of God, will take care of you wherever you go. So I don't think I am unique. I am very sure it is multiplied a million times in many other young people in the Philippines. And how did this or did this lead to your vocation and has Mary had a hand over you? Do you believe that Mary has had a hand over you throughout all of your different ordinations and finally to your Episcopal nomination? She is my only companion, and I believe that. And uh, she has been with me all these years, and I am very sure even if there are times when I take her for granted or I ignore her, she never leaves my side. And. Uh, there were times when I did not know that my wine was running out. But later on in life, I understood that Mary told Jesus, your priest has no wine. He does not even notice it, but I have seen it. Please bring back the wine in his ministry. And that has been repeated many times in my life. You, as I mentioned, are responsible for the Mariological Society for Asia. What role does and what responsibility. What calling does Asia have uh, under this guidance of Our Lady as a witness to the rest of the world? We echo St. John Paul II in invoking Mary as the star of your evangelization. We believe that it is the Mother of God who prepares the people to receive the gospel eventually. And uh, in the Philippines especially and for the rest of Asia, as I said, there is a stamp of being Marian in our being Christian. And uh, 
the Asia Oceania Mariological Conference is actually held usually in the Philippines, but the last time was held in Taiwan because uh, we want to stress that Mary is Asian and Mary is the perfect Asian if you want to look for a model. And uh, Mary being the first model of discipleship could really be the mother who will take care of all of us. A quick jump, vocations in the Philippines. On the decline, on the rise, uh, and um, how do you encourage, as we've spoken about earlier, young men who are confronting consumerism and materialism, of all these distractions, really, how do you encourage vocations? Uh, and are there young men responding still to the call of the priesthood? Actually, actually there is no decline. It's just that we are not able to cope with the population increase. That is why the ratio of priests to parishioners is increasing and increasing because it takes nine years to produce a priest and nine months to produce a parishioner. So it, we cannot cope. Yes. But uh, we have ordinations and we have many young people who are still longing to serve the Lord. And uh, when it comes to serving the Lord in the Philippine context, it is not just the priest or the religious who becomes the mouthpiece of God because our lay people are equally active. In fact, in many other parts of the Middle East and some parts of Europe, we have lay missionaries who leave home and country in order to be bringers of the gospel to other parts of the world. I understand this issue is also especially poignant in the Middle East, in countries where Filipinos serve often in homes, uh, in Muslim environments, because many have said that the Filipinos working in these Muslim environments are also catechists because they are with the children, they might pray with them and introduce them, these Muslim children, for the first time to the faith. That is true because uh, it has been said that if you scratch the skin of any Filipino, you will see that the blood that comes out is Catholic. It is in the DNA, so to speak. It is already in the genes. That is why even if they are out of the Philippines, Longing for home, they express that longing for home by doing what they used to do at home. And what are they used to doing at home? Praying the rosary, reading the Bible, going down on their knees, praying before the image of the Virgin Mary, or kissing the crucifix. So they do that even if they are in Muslim areas. They do that even if they are in an area that is hostile where the priest cannot go, our Catholic lay Filipinos go, and they practice the faith, and they become an inspiration for others. There is, a, of course, a shadow side to this uh, work of the Filipinos abroad. I believe they send something like $8 billion uh, back to the Filipinos every year in remittances, and that is the effect on the family here. That is, the wife or the husband goes abroad to work to generate the income. But the family here, of course, suffers. How, what is the voice of the church in this question? How do you counsel in this obvious, very economic need, but at the same time, knowing the impact that this might have on the family? You know, I was having an exchange with some European and American bishops about the issue of divorce and separation. They were saying that a husband and a wife separate because they quarrel because of irreconcilable differences. I was sharing my faith with them and said, in the Philippines, husband and wife separate, not because of a quarrel, but because of love. They separate because they love each other. They separate, one goes out of the country to work, sacrifice, endure homesickness, so that they can send home some money in order to provide better education, better life for their children here at home. They are separated, but the separation is because of love. It is not because of a quarrel. But eventually, it, be, it causes some problems because the distance uh, also affects the relationship. And the child grows up with a father or a mother stranger to him or her because 
the child did not grow the did not see the mother or the father as he or she was growing up. But uh, thanks to technology, also with uh, social media, we are able to communicate. We are able to see each other face to face, and uh, it has helped also. Although it is not perfect, but it has. Uh, met the need to be in touch and to, with the families at and home. And to see. There's also one element which is important, and that is the role of the catechists. Uh, the Philippines is, I believe, 7,600 islands, many of which are uninhabited, but with very, very far-flung populations. And as you mentioned earlier, no priest necessarily to be able to make all those distances to visit those in his parish the role of the catechist and how the church is trying to encourage the role of the catechist and can you tell us a little bit about this? The need for the catechists is formation because in philosophy we say we cannot give what we do not have. So the ongoing need is for constant formation, ongoing formation. If a doctor makes a mistake, the mistake goes to the cemetery. If a lawyer makes a mistake, the mistake goes to jail. But if a catechist makes a mistake, the mistake goes to hell. It is a very serious responsibility. And the role of the catechist is to bring people to God and to bring people to heaven. But while the challenge is great, the formation must also be great. It must also be deep. Because it is not enough that they know the doctrine they must be able to love the doctrine and live the doctrine. Your Excellency, thank you for having been with us today in our program. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for having been with us today on Where God Weeps. We've been speaking with His Excellency Archbishop Socrates Villegas about the situation in the Philippines, the Catholic Church, the role of the Church, and its needs. If you would like to help through prayer or concrete action, I would encourage you to look at the contact information at the end of this program. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Take care.